very good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Vice Chancellor's Great Debate. Now in its third year, the Vice Chancellor's Great Debate is an opportunity for the University of Birmingham and the wider community to come together to debate and to reflect upon one of the great issues of our day. Tonight's theme is trolls, flat earthers and fake news purveyors. What are the challenges we face in trusting social media? When we decided to hold tonight's debate, two things were very different. First, we'd anticipated holding the debate in the Elgar Concert Hall at the heart of the University of Birmingham, a wonderful setting. However, like so much in our lives, tonight's debate will be virtual and digital. Secondly, we'd no idea we would be holding this debate in the middle of a global pandemic, where social media has been central. It's been central to how people get their news. It's been central to how they share their experiences of the pandemic. And it's been central to the way in which they have accommodated themselves to new realities. So social media is and will be a crucial part of our lives. Tonight's debate is how we live with it, how we use it, how we trust it. We've brought together a hugely distinguished panel. They are Anne McAvoy, Senior Editor at The Economist and a regular presenter of Free Thinking, Radio 3's Arts and Ideas magazine. Isabel Oakeshott, writer, broadcaster, public speaker and former political editor of The Sunday Times. Will Moy, Chief Executive of Full Fact, the UK's independent fact, fact checking charity and Professor Alice Roberts, anatomist, author and broadcaster, and Professor of Public Engagement in Science here at the University of Birmingham. And I'm delighted to welcome back Rutula Shah once again to moderate tonight's debate. Rutula is the main presenter of Radio 4's The World Tonight. She started her career here in Birmingham on their Midlands Production Training Scheme. From there, she moved to the Today programme, editing it for eight years before joining the BBC's World Service. She's also a regular presenter of Any Questions and has chaired each of our Vice Chancellor's great debates. Matula, it's a great pleasure to welcome you back and I am now handing over to you to steer this evening's great debate. Thank you, Sir David, and welcome to this year's Vice Chancellor's Great Online Debate. I'm sorry not to be in Birmingham, but this is our new normal. We can be together, but separately. And it is, of course, the internet and the kit and caboodle that comes with it that is enabling us to exchange views remotely. And it is, of course, fundamental to the discussion we're going to have tonight. Trolls, flat earthers and fake news purveyors. What are the challenges we face in trusting social media? But let's step back into the old world for a moment. There used to be a saying in journalism, and I hasten to add it was just a saying, uh, which is never let the facts get in the way of a story. And I'd like to think it wasn't banded about, about by the panel tonight. But it is undoubtedly a feature of the online world that we all now inhabit. And there are levels of this tweaking of truth. There's the white lie of the carefully curated bookshelf. I'm saying absolutely nothing. There's also the sort of more serious political issue of the doctored political video. There are the loud, hyper-partisan voices unwilling to accept anything that doesn't fit inside their political bubble. There are the earnest Twitter threads promising some sort of groundbreaking revelation. And let's not forget the people touting concoctions that will cure you of coronavirus. I could go on and on and on. So who or what should you believe on social media? How has this cacophony of voices and opinions affected our public discourse? Should we celebrate the idea of the more the merrier? Or has this democratisation of opinion and the exchange of ideas actually revealed a darker, more malevolent side to society. Well, there's lots to get to grips with. On our panel today, Anne McElvoy, Will Moy, Isabel Oakeshott and Professor Alice Roberts, welcome to you all. 
I'm going to begin by giving each of you a couple of minutes to set out your thoughts on tonight's debate topic. Then we'll open out the debate uh, and take on board some of the questions that have been submitted by our audience. But I'm going to ask you to begin with two minutes. Anne McElvoy, if I can come to you first. Sure. Well, whenever I hear about the horrors and dramas of social media, uh, I'm cast back to one of the earliest examples, and it doesn't just come from uh, watching the social network and looking at the early days of Mark Zuckerberg. You know, it goes back to 1789, when in the obviously very turbulent aftermath of the French Revolution, the story did the rounds in Paris and beyond that vengeful aristocrats were going to burn down the houses and often very modest dwellings uh, of peasants. And it was entirely fake news, as we'd now say. It was known as the Great Fear, which would now be hashtag Great Fear. And, but it was very powerful and it was completely fake news. There were many other examples of that. I mean, the Renaissance Italy was absolutely full of, of fake news, often intended to boost prices um, of valuable goods and of, of paintings of whatever you wanted to do. Um, the reason I think this is so relevant now is to ask ourselves if we're worried about fake news, what do we think is motivating it? What's behind it? Two things I would suggest, not only, but primarily, and other panelists will have their own thoughts. One is that false stories are attractive. We like them more than we think we like them. And even very smart people who look down on fake news and the payers of it are probably doing a bit of it themselves without realizing. Because false stories are quite interesting. They travel further and faster than true ones because they have an element of surprise or disruption to them. The second reason is that they're convenient and whoever started the great fear in 1789 or the, the merchants in Italy who wanted to use fake news to raise prices or to get back perhaps some territory from an enemy, are just doing what uh, those in politics who are accused of fake news are doing today. They're trying to grab bits of territory and hold on to it by getting our attention and they're not so concerned about the truth. Does it matter? I think we'll come to that. So I'm going to keep my, my thoughts short. I think it does matter. I think measuring the impact of it, however, is imperfect. And I think a lot of things that people think are fake news are often things that have some basis in truth but they may not want to hear. So they notice the distortion, but they don't notice the kernel of truth. I'm going to leave that there because uh, I think uh, I like Richard's introduction about sayings of journalists. And uh, one that I always remember when 24 hour news got going was never wrong for long. So that's going to be <laughs> my point. And we won't say who that refers to. Uh, Professor Alice Roberts, two minutes from you, please. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, I think it does matter and it matters a huge amount. I think that it's very clear, especially in the situation we're in at the moment, that the powerful tools have at our disposal for reducing human suffering, for making sure that we don't outstrip the capability of this planet to sustain us, are there and are within our grasp and fake news threatens to diminish that. And that means having a negative impact on, on the planet more widely, but it also means having a negative impact on humans. And it does translate into loss of life at the end of the day. So we can look back to H.G. Uh, Wells, who wrote essays in 1936, looking forward to the democratization of knowledge, looking forward to a, a time when there would be a world brain, when all of the ideas were completely interconnected and he celebrated that and he thought that it would be a time of peace and harmony. Now that our ideas are interconnected and we do have this democratised access to knowledge, it's quite, it's perhaps not, a, not quite as peaceful and harmonious as we expected it to be. But I think we can understand that if we think about the relationship between knowledge and power. There's always been a relationship between knowledge and power, there still is a relationship between knowledge and power. And I think that democratisation is something that we should celebrate, but we also need to understand how that's going to destabilise um, some of our politics. We saw a shift from the way that knowledge was bound up with religious institutions. And let's not forget how outrageous it was when the Bible was translated into English, letting everybody read it uh, for themselves. And we see a shift from religious institutions to uh, to governments, to, uh, to the legal system, to media. And now in the 21st century, we're seeing another shift as well. 
So perhaps the instability is, is something that we, we should have foreseen. We should have been able to, or HG Wells should have been able to realise that perhaps it wouldn't be um, quite as harmonious a path, at least, as he expected. I think universities are crucial in this. I think universities are crucial because they're at the forefront of knowledge, which can help us enormously. And they're also um, great institutions uh, focused on education as well. And we need people to be able to spot fake news and to be able to distinguish that from real facts. Thank you very much. Isabel Oakeshott. Well, I think that the coronavirus crisis has really shone a fierce spotlight on the power of social media and uh, the ills that fake news can do. But at the same time, it has also um, shown just how much of a force for good social media can be. Um, you know, if we look at, uh, for example, Captain Tom Moore, that whole thing took off as a result of social media. So it's not just a negative force. And I think in terms of the impact, you know, Anne was talking about measuring the impact. It's very obvious um, from the coronavirus just how powerful and real the impact can be. I was trying in preparation for this debate to get to the bottom of where the loo roll crisis began. Exactly why did everybody start stockpiling loo roll? And I tried to trace it back and she had very little luck in this. But I do remember right at the beginning of March, being in a hairdressing salon for rather a long time. And the hairdressers there were all talking about the need to stockpile loo roll. Now, this was well before lockdown was even a, a thing. And my sense is that they almost certainly got this loo roll thing from Facebook and then it spiraled. And once it builds up momentum, it then has a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, word goes around that loo roll's about to run out. And before you know it, the shelves are empty. And we saw that spilling over into all sorts of other goods that there was absolutely no need for anybody to be stockpiling because there were no food shortages. So this impact is really very real. In terms of just how uh, severe the impact is, I think that the um, what Trump likes to call the mainstream media has such an important role here. And where we think the difficulty lies is in um, the, the new sort of branches of mainstream media, which is their online offering. So, for example, uh, Mail Online, which is the, the biggest purveyor of, of news in the world. Um, and, you know, the online branch of a newspaper, as it were, is a whole separate operation and works entirely differently and speed is of the essence. And yet it still has that newspaper's brand. So it is seen as... Uh, you know, a, a more established and responsible purveyor of news. So what we in the um, so-called mainstream media have to do is make sure that the generally young um, journalists that are working in those online newsrooms are not under so much pressure to churn stuff out that they're reporting without caveat. They're not bouncing off social media and reporting stuff as real when it actually isn't. Report by all means with caveat. And if I could just say one sort of positive example of more responsible reporting, um, and that would be looking at the supposed demise of Kim Jong-un. And, you know, this was obviously doing the rounds on social media, but I think mainstream media were very restrained about it. I looked in vain for a report from the BBC at that time about Kim Jong-un dying, and there was absolutely nothing there because the BBC had done what the BBC should do and just waited, waited, gathered information, realised that this just didn't have any actuality and they didn't report it. So those sort of trusted sources of media are still doing their thing. I don't think we should become too disheartened. So a healthy dose of cynicism and a reference to hairdressing. Oh, the fantasy of going to the hairdressers. <laughs> <laughs> Will Moy. Thank you. Uh, in a world with more information than ever, it's harder now to know what's true and what's not. And all around us, we see people exploiting that difficulty for political gain or financial gain, or hurting other people by being careless about the facts they spread. Bad information ruins lives. It promotes hate, it damages people's health, and it hurts democracy. And right now, people who choose to misuse information have an easy time of it. 
Full Fact is a charity. We fight bad information. We're independent fact checkers and campaigners who try to find, expose, and counter the harm it does. And we do that in a few different ways. Firstly, we're a direct source of information for the public. Millions of people come to Full Fact to get information they feel they can rely on fact checking um, important claims in public debate. Secondly, when we spot things that are wrong, we ask people to correct the record. And thirdly, when we spot patterns in how bad information comes to affect public debate, we intervene and ask for systems changes, whether it's from government or from newspapers in how they handle corrections or official statisticians in how they communicate, or now more and more the internet companies in the choices they make about the information all of us see. Coronavirus has shown us some of the most damaging parts of this. It's shown us not only people taking health advice that could kill them or hurt them, but also people using this story to jump on with old hatreds and stir up traditional um, well-known um, forms of hatred that don't need any more airtime than they already get online. Um, we've seen people uh, at an extreme attacking cell phone towers and people who work on them out of um, scared up fears of new technologies. These are real harms. What we have to remember is that free speech has real benefits and that trying to tackle these harms cannot come at the cost of being an open society. And I think one of the hardest debates we're going to have over the next few decades, not in one go, is actually how we find a new settlement in this new information environment between the harms that false information really can do and the imperative to maintain free speech in an open society. Thank you very much. So you all agree, essentially, that there is good and bad to be had here. There are countless surveys where people say they don't trust social media. And yet we also know that the main social media platforms are increasingly a very, very important source of news for, for millions of people. So is it trust that there's a problem? Because actually people are saying they're wary. They're wary of what they're seeing here. Or is it the nature of the debate that flows from what we're all seeing and reading and absorbing on some level? And I wonder what you think about that. I would say it's, it's a very interesting question because I think it depends what you think the status, and I'm sure we'll want to come to this, what the status of the platform is. And is it a publisher, as many in the mainstream media, so to speak, um, we will speak fluent Corbyn now. Um, it, it, is, it, it is a platform, as far as I can it is publishing, it is a publisher. Obviously, the social media companies are very keen not to be classified as such because that would open them to much greater liability. And they see themselves, if you like, as a, as a channel. So I think the, the last point, quite rightly, there is this balance between free speech and avoiding harms or decreasing harms, which are very real. And I really don't intend to, to play them down, particularly when it comes to the virus or aspects of, uh, of hate speech or, or politically motivated um, dissemination of, of wrong facts, which are intended to, to, to do damage and close the debate. But I do think in, in the end, I think it can come close to just complaining about humankind. And I think if you're looking back, and I just chose a couple of things from, from history, we will always see that fascination with something that is new, which is spicy, which is disruptive, and which may also, and quite often is wrong. I am more concerned that we hold, we want to hold feet to the fire, that the platforms uh, are making all a lot of money, advertising funded from doing this, are uh, kept in the debate and not with a view to them all being sort of regulated in some sort of way but they cannot i think go on at the moment having it both ways they are making massive revenues from the dissemination of this information and if anything i'm very surprised if i'll just you know, sort of put, put, put one label on it but quite a lot of of sort of liberal small liberal whatever you want to call it progressive people are reasonably calm about about this in the way that they're always very worked up about the, the daily mail or the mainstream media we heard Mark Zuckerberg this morning saying that Facebook is going to take down articles that promise false cures for coronavirus and 5G misinformation and so on. Is that enough? Will Moy, is this question of trust one that we should place firmly in it, on social media companies rather than in our own hands? I don't think we should get too hung up on the question of trust. People's self-reporting of who they trust and under what circumstances is, is deeply unreliable, ironically. Um, and of course, we've had highly influential media media outlets that many of the public would say they don't trust to tell the truth for decades. 
So simply asking people, what do you trust, is not a great guide to what will people pay attention to, what will influence people's beliefs and their behavior. What people are paying attention to in the older generation is still TV. TV is still the largest source of news uh, in this country. And it's worth remembering, we have not shifted fully into the online world we will be in. But the younger generation particularly is far more in that by default. And it's hugely important media outlets, some of which many people haven't heard of. Um, so it's really important to understand that we are seeing the opening stages of a change in our society now, not the completeness of it. In terms of what Facebook is doing, uh, they came to Full Fact last year and they asked us to join something called the Third Party Fact Checking Program, which involves them referring to us things that they have spotted on their platform that they think might potentially be false. And if we fact check them and find them to be false, they will flag that to users of Facebook and say, you're thinking of sharing this, before you share, would you like to read this fact check? People still have the choice to uh, share or not to share, but they get that extra information from independent fact checkers at that point. That is useful. It is useful in preventing health harms. It's useful in emergency situations, such as after terrorist attacks. It's useful in tackling election interference. Is it enough? No, it's not. Isabel Oakeshott, what would be enough then? You know, you, I like the idea of promoting cynicism in a sense. People should be more critical of, of what they're looking at, journalists and the, the consumer of the information. But who else should we turn to? There is this constant fine line between regulation and free speech. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a, a sort of generational opportunity here. You know, we can start now during this lockdown by all home educating our children as best we can to ask about what the source of something is. You know, this is something, you know, you do a degree at university, you're relentlessly taught to do. You know, what is the source? I studied history and we were always, it was indoctrinated us to, to look at, with a critical eye at who was saying what and why. And of course, as a, as a journalist, that is crucial. You know, you're always having to think when you're given information, what is this person's agenda? What could they be using me? What do they, why do they want to get this out here? And crucially, the, this sort of sense that if, if something is seems too good to be true, if it's too funny, if it's too ridiculous, then it probably isn't true. So it's sort of um, getting a the new generation um, who are going to be, um, as, as, as Full Facts was saying earlier, they are going to be transitioning, they're already transitioning into an arena in which the traditional media is playing a minimal part, taking a very critical starting point to everything they see. By all means, share it, share it and laugh at it and you know, have some fun with it, but know the difference. And that actually can be really difficult. I mean, I was thinking back to one of the early really funny videos that went round at the beginning of the lockdown of what seems to be the Chinese authorities um, cracking down on a, um, on a local resident who had refused to stop at some Corona check borders. And he appeared to be sort of trapped under a giant fishing net. And it was actually a really funny video. And I still don't know whether it was true or not. It was a kind of, it could have been true, who knows? So you've just got to, you know, not take it as gospel. And if you're that interested, look into it. But, you know, you're having that sceptical starting point. Uh, Alice Roberts, you talked about the role of knowledge, the role of universities, of education. But who, where does this balance lie? Who has to take responsibility if we are going to make sense of what we're seeing? I think um, I think everybody does. So um, I agree completely with Isabel. You know, we 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 educate our children. We we ask them to be critical, to look at sources. Um, as universities, we have a role to play. The funding bodies have a role to play. The way the funding bodies uh, look at our research, all of that um, is is part of part of the discussion. So I think it goes from individuals all the way up to institutions, and and then up to government as well. And you know, we're, we're, is there a role for regulation if you think if if you think there's government responsibility? I think there's government responsibility to um, ab about integrity and about sources of information, and it's very worrying when we have uh, leaders questioning trusted sources of uh, of information 
and you know trying to cast aspersions on those because you know we do have situations where where people are saying yes i'm being critical about my sources it's just that they're they're not trusting the sources we would like them to trust um and uh, you know if we if we think that there are sources which are um generally speaking about uh, doing good in the world about looking after people not about territory grabbing um but about looking after looking after individuals and looking after the planet we somehow need to shift it towards that but it's it's very difficult i mean birmingham was host to um the uk's first flat earth convention i don't know um if our vice chancellor was aware of this a few years ago not the university um but birmingham itself was host to a flat earth convention a few years ago and a researcher went along to uh, that convention just to try to understand uh, the arguments and try to understand what people were saying and why they were coming up with this idea and um and what they were saying was very similar to what isabel was saying they were saying we must be critical about our sources but what they were saying is we must not trust the scientists we must so not trust the main very different uh, conclusion. Well, let me open it up to the questions that we have. And we've had lots of really great questions. Uh, Trevor Hardy, actually, this, this flows very nicely from what you were saying, asks, as scientists, we use logical inquiry and empirical data to find the facts and dispel misinformation. How do we convey these scientific facts to people that are either unwilling or incapable of understanding the empirical facts presented to them? Well, Moy, this is kind of your day job. I mean, it is a challenge, isn't it? People don't always want to believe what is presented to them. And once there's evidence to suggest, once the untruth is out there, it's quite hard to unpick it. Yes, although that evidence actually, when people tried to reproduce it, turned out to be hard to reproduce. Um, and that's the scientific process for you in a nutshell. Knowing what you know at any one point, you may know something different further down the line, and that should engender a certain amount of humility in all scientists. That business, that description in the question of we use empirical knowledge to get facts that, that can drive decisions, well, let's start by examining that a little bit. There's a lovely study which presented people with a table of data and asked them to find the trends in it. And then they put the labels on the table of data, which were about gun control, and asked them to have another go. And what they found was, of course, once people knew the topic, their brains kicked into gear and we did all the things we do as humans. And uh, they came up with answers that they liked based on their political views. But people who were highly trained in numbers had more tools in their toolkit to help them do that. So even those of us who are striving to provide rigorous factual evidence should start by being a bit humble about what that looks like and recognize not just the limits of our process, but the limits of our knowledge. That famous question, whose GDP? It's not yours, it's not mine, it's yours, actually has a grain of truth behind it. Our reliance on aggregate and average views of the country can tell a very full story about many people's lives and in some cases, most people's lives. So having said all that, having been realistic about the limits of knowledge and being open with that about people, to give them power, not take power to the experts, then the next thing is actually communication is hard. And the people who are really good at finding knowledge are not necessarily the people who are really good at communicating knowledge. And we have some brilliant examples of people who can cover both sides of that equation. We're very lucky, and I'm sitting in this panel with Alice, and I'm privileged to do that. But there are not that many academics who are equally comfortable on both sides of that line. The career structures for academia do not reward uh, academics taking the time to put into that kind of work. I've been really pleased to see the work of the UK in a changing Europe on the Brexit debate, which has pushed academics into that space very fruitfully. But we need to recognize that communication is a skill and a discipline and needs tools that we need to encourage into the academic space and vice versa. Well, Alice Roberts, if I can bring you in then, there's, there's a, the, the facts move, the facts change, and we're seeing that with coronavirus very clearly. Um, is it about communication or is it then about the fact that we're often trying to suggest the certainty even about the facts when perhaps there really isn't and is that the thing that we need to teach people i think there's a there's a lot of questions within that question um one of the one of the really important issues um around science communication is the communication of uncertainty and we're seeing that really thrown into thrown into relief here with with coronavirus 
because it's a time of high anxiety and it's a time of enormous uncertainty and people are reaching out for certainty. Now, outside of that epidemic, we, we, we see that happening in other ways. We see it quite regularly uh, within the field of um, alternative medicine, um, where I would agree with Tim Minchin, it's either medicine or it's not. There's no such thing as alternative medicine. Um, people turn to alternative medicine in extremis. They tend to turn to alternative medicine when they've tried everything else and they're desperate and they're anxious and there's a certainty being offered to them. And, and that's what we're seeing, you know, they're, they're all the, lots and lots of cures that have been uh, floated out there for, for coronavirus. Um, you know, some of which have emanated from, from some of the world's great leaders. And, you know, those are, we're seeing people wanting to grab certainty in a time when actually the science itself is uncertain. And it was interesting that the Royal Society came out this week with Brian Cox um, saying, you know, it's really important that we don't deliver that message of certainty because that's how we're going to lose trust. If we say we are following the science, then we're yeah. going to lose trust. The science is not monolithic. Science is a process. And the, the data we have is constantly evolving and the predictions are constantly evolving and our response should be constantly evolving. So but we need to I'm somehow... The yeah. conversation. If, if I can bring you in, that's a, a, a subtle and a nuanced answer. There isn't the space, is there necessarily to be that subtle and nuanced on social media? Well, that's a, a fair point, but I think I have a few challenges to what I've heard. Um, one would be that the idea of, from the questioner of, of you know, what you're going to do about people who are either resistant to messages about, it was particularly about science, but I think we could sort of take it more broadly about sort of truthful accounts when you have strong anti-truth vectors in social media. Uh, and that, that in some ways people might be incapable of understanding, but I find that too lofty. And I think it's a tone, I think universities have to be a bit careful with if I could just put it that way, um, back to, to the gentleman asking the question. Because one of the reasons, frankly, that Birmingham isn't hosting more flat earth uh, conferences all that bigger institutions, institutions which transact knowledge, haven't bought into it is because it's been disproved. So something did move on there. You will always have a few people who believe that Elvis is on the moon. You will always have flat earthers more damagingly at the moment. We're seeing really, uh, for me, one of the most interesting and disturbing movements is how many educated people are taking to the anti-vax movement. It's not always about, and there's a slight suggestion around incapable that you're just a bit too stupid. You know, what can we do? Hey, it's so difficult dealing with you. I think when we get into that and i'm not saying academia is by the only place that does this i think aspects of the media do it aspects of politics do it and certainly in the brexit debate it's been a tone it's like what can we do they're so stupid and i think when you get there you've lost the argument so if someone's been incapable and it's probably it's it may not be the people that you think it is but i would say we do know that there can be turn points in these arguments either tragically because people are affected by the consequences of their actions coronavirus one hopes not so much with the anti-vax movement, but it is there, and, and you will know that it is there in in, uh, you know, in in what has happened with the uptick in measles and mumps. People do learn; they're very capable of learning. It's often too long a process. What we should be looking for is how we shorten that process and how we make that information or correction appealing and not just a lecture. Isabella, I am going to come to you, but I just want to drop in. It's interesting. Another one of our questioners, Rachel, uh, actually picks up a similar point. She says, um, does the misinformation spread on social media simply not reflect a gap between ways of communicating current science and the average member of the general population? And is this gap not perpetuated by elitist academic institutions, paywall journals and writing in language not understandable to the general public? I throw that in there, Isabel, because it's, it's again, a, a similar point to the one we're discussing. Yes, I mean, I think as a, as a breed, academics are very poor communicators. When I was political editor of the Sunday Times, I used to dread dealing with academics because their world was very much on the one hand, but on the other and round and round and round. We would go in our conversations with me trying to get something that was quotable and there would be far too many caveats. And, you know, when you're when you're reporting, what you want is something crisp and clear. Um, this is why it's so wonderful working for the Daily Mail, because everything's black and white in Daily Mail land. And that makes the job much easier. Um, and I think academics don't help themselves with the, that lack of um, understanding about how the media works. And it's fine if there's uncertainty, 
but they've got to be clear about the fact there's uncertainty and a very, you know, there are ways of communicating uncertainty. And I think that has been a massive problem in the coronavirus crisis. I mean, look at what's going on now with the teaching unions who are asking for evidence and not just evidence, but proof in some cases that there won't be a risk if we, we open the schools again and bring children back. Look, there's never going to be proof that there's no risk and something's gone very wrong in the communication of the science around coronavirus where a apparently respected enormous trade union can actually use language like that so i would appeal to academics to be much crisper in their uh, in their line of arguments and to understand better how the media works what they're looking for and unfortunately it does sometimes mean producing sound bites. It doesn't mean that you have to be false uh, to the information as you understand it. You just have to give a bit more clarity. And if you don't know, say you don't know, and we're going to have to live with that. Alice, I'm going to let you come back briefly and then we'll move on. Yes, I do think, I mean, just picking up on on, on that particular um, clash and, uh, and, and communication breakdown, because that's what it is. I think that there are there are problems on both sides. If you've got some people saying, we want you to demonstrate that it's absolutely safe for us to make this change. Mm. Whilst on the other hand, you have politicians saying it is absolutely safe. And that's what we've had. So somehow we need to get back into the nuance of it. The politicians should be saying we will make it as safe as we possibly can. They cannot make these guarantees. And if they make those guarantees, they lose trust. And of course, okay. immediately the teachers are going to go, you can't make that guarantee. We should come back to social media because that is what we're here to discuss. Obviously, coronavirus is a big part of it right now. Um, I want to turn to Chris Collinger's question. Uh, he or she says some countries have introduced legislation to curb fake news, such as Singapore's Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Act. However, with governments around the world becoming increasingly censorious and autocratic, are we between the devil and the deep blue sea? Isabel, I wonder what you think about that. And, and I should say that act uh, allows for 10 years imprisonment for breaking the law. And the government says, obviously, it's to protect people from online uh, falsehoods. Critics say it's a way to silence criticism of the government. Yeah, I don't like it. Instinctively, I don't like it. I think it's the thin end of the wedge. You know, what? what is one, one person's idea of unacceptable and dangerous is another person's idea of just putting a different point of view. And I think that that politically becomes very dangerous territory. I also think this is a bit like standing under a waterfall and trying to catch the water in your hands, you know, and Niagara Falls at that. You know, this is, it's an impossible tide to turn back. Um, and I think that such legislation runs a risk of being quickly discredited because it simply won't be able to match the kind of torrent of of nonsense and borderline offensive material which may or may not actually come under the letter of the law of being dangerous i think we're in a very very uh, sort of um troublesome landscape there and it's better not to go there with the regulation will moyer you alluded to the importance of free speech where do you stand on this there are proposals i think here in the uk for ofcom uh, to have new powers to force social media to act if they see harmful content and so on. But how much further should that sort of regulation go? Yes, and it's important to say those proposals are much broader than just whether information is true or not. So they cover the full range of what the government likes to describe as online harms. But also point out about the Singapore law that it's a lot more than the thin end of the wedge. That wedge is like firmly inserted at that point. And any choices made by open societies in this context can be used as excuses by other autocratic governments around the world for much worse action. We have to be careful of the responsibility we hold there. That said, the non-regulation argument essentially says that the internet companies, for commercial reasons in California, will set their terms and conditions, or in other countries around the world, some of them less open societies, will set their terms and conditions of what can and cannot be said, and those will be enforced. And so the balance between free speech and harm will be decided by Mark Zuckerberg, or Jack Dorsey, or someone like that. I think that these decisions should be made through open, democratic, transparent processes. I think they're enormously nuanced. If we take another ex international example, Germany has very strong laws against promotion of Nazism. And that is 
many people feel appropriate in its cultural and historical context. Nobody necessarily has to believe that the line should be drawn exactly in the same place in Germany as it is in the UK. But however that choice is made, I would like to see it openly, democratically and transparently debated. That is not happening at the moment because Parliament has dodged the issue. Alice, I wonder where you stand on this. I think that free speech is, is, as Will says, absolutely essential to an open society. It is also part of how we move knowledge forward. And Isabel, right at the beginning of this debate, uh, flagged up the fact that social media isn't all bad. You know, there are, there are really good aspects to it as well. And, you know, certainly within science, we can see the way that that works and that, you know, we we publish our findings in, in academic journals, but then then once they're published and sometimes even before they're published, um, they are they're released, they're out there. And we see scientists very active on social media. There's, a, there's an extended peer review. And we've seen particular cases where uh, publications have been revised, have been even taken down because of that extended peer review process. So I think that the, the opportunity has to be there to have those open discussions, whether it's about whether it's about politics and where you draw the line um, or you know, whether it's about science itself. The conversation is useful uh, and, and then we have to work on how we uh, lessen the damaging information that gets out there. I mean, I, I certainly feel on social media that scientists have a massive uh, um, job to communicate with the public. Um, we should be training our scientists much better. We should be um, we should be tooling them up with skills to to communicate better. We should be partnering with uh, other organisations and, and other individuals who have those skills as well. Um, and you know we we need to be getting uh, our voices out there. There is this flux. There is this Niagara Falls, but somewhere within it, we need to be pumping out um, the trusted information as well. Anna, I just wonder though, everybody's defending free speech and if Singapore's law is a rather extreme example, what do you say to those who point to the bullying that goes on on social media that would say that in a sense it can be simply a license to speak with impunity? Well, I think it should. I mean, I think, I think there is a bit of a license to speak with impunity. I mean, if you're a defender of free speech, that's what you believe. But that it's impunity as in you should be able to say what you want. It doesn't mean there's impunity about any calculation of harms. Uh, so I'm always a little worried about the, the argument turning into, I don't think you should say that as opposed to this is the harm that you were doing. I know it seems a little bit like a, a fine divide, but I think it's exactly where the Singapore example is right on the cusp. But if you imagine where Singapore is headed, then, you know, you can imagine China and other authoritarian regimes being some steps considerably further. You do have a free speech case to answer. It's very hard. Free speech is in one way indivisible. It's indivisible, but it also leads you into areas, as you say, of whether it's bullying. I was thinking it was about suicide prevention, which we, we, we haven't touched on, but it's a very, I think, an area where the platforms wised up really quickly, you know, that they better do something about that because the harm is so absolute. It's not even a case where you can sort of stumble on the one hand on the other. You know, you can have two views about how much damage is being done. It is directly damaging. I come back really to, and I'm sorry, I have only one practical solution here, which is the state is a very bad direct regulator, which is why we we have our arm's length state broadcasters like the BBC, but we don't on the whole. I mean, sometimes goes that way, but we try not to kind of call up the culture section and ask what should be on the six o'clock news. Um, we like that arm's length relationship, but you do have then have to decide who is going to be the regulator of this if it is not the state. And I would suggest that the pressure really should be basically partly through the, on the shareholders and on the, on the companies themselves. I'm less convinced about the ability other than through, as Alice and others have mentioned, good example, good communication, engagement. I mean, should you, you know, interesting question, should those who are defending good science be bolder? Should they be going out and actively seeking engagement with those who hold unscientific views, anti-vax, et cetera, or views on coronavirus? I just put it out there because I think it's a little bit comfortable to say, we will continue doing what we were doing and eventually we'll get better at it and other people will come round. 
I'm sorry, I, I do feel skeptical about that. I don't think there's much proof that that works. But I'm not for taking the pressure off the social media companies at all. They are moving towards uh, along probably with big oil being sort of public enemy number one or, or two in, in, in public policy terms. And that's not a very comfortable position for them. It's worth keeping the pressure on. So Christine Powell's question follows quite nicely from that. And it is on the face of it a very simple question, but I think there's quite a lot that you can explore behind it, which is what do the people who spread false news and fake news hope to gain? I think this question of agendas, which actually I think, Isabel, you brought up at the beginning. I mean, there's there are many agendas between what about why people may choose to spread fake news. I mean, what, what do you think are the important ones? Well, the obvious important, but there are two very obvious agendas. One is political. So in order to shift public opinion away from whether it's the ruling party, the ruling administration towards an opposition or in favour of the uh, existing administration. I mean, there was an example of this, I think, fairly recently where there were question marks over the um, political affiliations of a number of uh, healthcare professionals who were spreading positive stories about performance over corona, the government's performance over coronavirus. And then, you know, there was a big question mark whether those people had actually been sort of arranged by the government to go on social media, which was would not entirely be unrealistic. So you've got the political impetus, and then there's often a very clear commercial impetus. And I use the word commercial in the broadest possible terms. It could be commercial because it's me as a fellow shop freelancer advertising myself and my, uh, you know, this is me sort of putting myself in the shop window and asking broadcasters to take me on and give my Tupney's worth. Or there's a, a much more commercial impetus for people who are saying, actually, these existing masks are no good, you know, uh, people should watch out. And, and then you discover that actually they've got some link, a very simplistic example, but they've got some link or interest in a ma manufacturer of an alternative product. So that's just two examples of the type of agendas that might distort the news uh, that, that is being peddled out there. Uh, and that goes back to what we were all discussing before about questioning who the source is. And that can be really difficult. You know, something academics are very cognizant of when they publish papers and, you know, when it gets into a journal, they must uh, always list who their sponsors are and, you know, similarly with politicians, they have to declare an interest. So it's just that when it comes to sort of however many characters we're now allowed on Twitter, there isn't really room to declare an interest. So you're really asking your audience to kind of conduct a, an investigation of their own. And in, in a fast paced environment, that all too often doesn't happen. It's not realistic. But Will Moy, do you think there is enough awareness of that actually the, the political impetus perhaps, because we take political sides in debates, but the commercial in impetus and the importance of the data that's being gathered. Do you think if we need to learn to trust social media, we also need to understand what's going on behind that thing that you're scrolling? Well, I think you're absolutely right on that. There's a, a new generation of media literacy for the new media environment we find ourselves in. And there the old questions um, that Isabel in fact talked about earlier, what's your source, what's their motive, they are still crucial fundamental questions, but there are new questions and new contexts for those questions that people are still learning and getting to grips with. One of the really interesting motivations for spreading false information that Isabel didn't mention is to help people. If you think about the people who are spreading false information about health, how many of them do you think are, think are doing harm to their friends or family? And how many of them do you think are trying to be helpful, getting something mm -hmm. and then putting it out there? The anti-vaccine movement is probably not full of malicious people. It may have some, but it's mm -hmm. probably yeah. also full of people who are trying to help. And we really need to understand uh, and respect where people are coming from in order to provide them with information that is actually useful in that kind of context. So. There is, there's a lot going on here that needs disentangling and taking it back to that argument that should there be regulation, who should be making these decisions? The answer should be that we are making proportionate responses to specific causes of harm. So when you think about legislation in other areas that restricts people's free speech, it is normally tightly drawn. There are restrictions. You cannot, for example, advertise a product for commercial gain, making false health claims. 
that is an offense. You can make false health claims in many other contexts, and you can advertise in many other contexts and make false claims, and it will not be a criminal offense, although the Advertising Standards Authority will have something to say to you. But the, the place where the criminal law kicks in is very tightly drawn. And that, I think, is something that we should draw on in moving forward. There is not one answer to how you regulate false information on social media. Getting into what, what are people's motives, what is the context, what is the subject matter, is how you find the proportionate responses and the real harms. Can I come I'm in sorry. here again? Oh. Yes, as well. Yeah, I just wanted to pick on, up on that because I think that's a really important point that, that Will makes about intention and motive. And it, it slightly sort of contradicts what I was saying about always asking what people's uh, motives are. I think it's really important that we don't get to a place where we assume that everybody has a self-interested or malign intent in everything that they put out there, even if they sometimes get it wrong. You know, otherwise we're in a place that is not very good for the soul, I don't think. It's not very good for our for our national togetherness and sense of, uh, of, of good spirit if we assume that everybody is out there for themselves and is trying to promote something for their own self-interest. Sometimes, you know, one just gets it wrong or puts something out there with good in one's heart. And it would be nice mm -hmm. if everybody doesn't take as a default position that something must have a, a, a kind of negative driving force behind it. Well, I, I wonder what you make of Thomas Leach's question. He asks, what do you believe is ultimately at the source of young people's general distrust of institutions and organisations? And what is social media's role within that? Um, I would have to blame politicians to an extent because you know, they they are um, very much to blame. It's, it goes back to the the era of spin, which, you know, sort of sort of kind of reached its zenith in the Blair administration. But, you know, I think it'd be unfair just to, to put it on that regime. And, you know, politicians are still distorting and they are and, and they always will. Um, and, you know, in again, in the context of coronavirus, we've got politicians clearly trying to argue that black is white, you know, and they are sort of trying to put a positive gloss on things. And in the end, you know, I think young people are quite entitled to just shrug and say a plague on all your houses. And I don't believe any of this stuff as it's reported on social media either. Alice, well, can, I just, can, I, can, I, can, can I just just kind of uh, fact check this a little bit? I'm so sorry, I, I, I'm reverting to type. But this idea that young people don't generally trust institutions, show me your data. Because I'm, I'm not I, I don't think from the evidence I've seen that that is true. Interestingly, if you look at the Ipsos Mori generations, generational analysis of the British Social Attitude Survey, young people, the younger generation, have noticeably less trust in the average man or woman in the street, which is the kind of the archetypal overall question about trust that we tend to ask, um, than older generations. But if you ask about institutions and specific ones, you get very mixed results. In um, doctors, teachers, very similar levels across the generations. In some professions, it's actually lower. So TV news readers is interesting lower. But thinking, think about the different experience of TV news readers that the youngest generation has had compared to the oldest generation. Um, mm. Whereas actually civil servants, trade unions, the younger generation shows a higher level of trust. So this whole we're in a crisis of trust, it's all happened suddenly. I hear it so much. They did polling in the middle of World War II where the public were evenly split about whether politicians were in it for themselves, their party or their country. If we couldn't get a government of national unity to earn the public's trust, we need to be a lot more focused before we start saying, oh, young people these days. And I think you wanted to come in too. Yes, I, I, I think that that's broadly right. And even if we take aside the demographics and we think that there is a mood, shall we say, of, of less trust or skepticism or even cynicism. I think that might, you know, one would be able to find a few data points for that, Will. Uh, I suspect that it's also, when people say, oh, it's so terrible because you're not as trusted as journalists as you used to be, or the government isn't trusted, or, the, you know, you, it's endless, as you, you say, the sort of bad news trust stories that go around. I do think trust and transparency are in tension with each other. And I think even in, you know, 
my age, whatever I'm now going to admit to, you should we say, in the prime of midlife, that I grew up in a much more trusting world and in some ways we trusted institutions that shouldn't have been trusted. And the reason that we had in a number of, of realms, both in organized religion, sex abuse scandals that were clearly going on at the time of which we had little insight, uh, knowledge, and certainly didn't have the information, to, to do anything about at scale. Or if you look at Jimmy Savile, the BBC was a great example there of you know, someone who was just trusted who should not have been trusted. I'm sorry, they're both from the same kind of area. And I don't mean that it's only about uh, sex abuse, but the more you open up to transparency, the more that you have lots of people, the democratic will involved in lots of decisions, I think you will see trust ratings uh, heading downwards, or at least not uh, not likely to become stratospheric any day now. And broadly speaking, I think that's okay. If anything, I will take my gamble on transparency over trust. Mm. Alice Roberts, I'm going to let you come back, and then I'm going to move on. Yes, I think that when we look at those polls, and and you look at the the most trusted people in society, then we still see that. Um, teachers, doctors and scientists fare extremely well in those polls. Um, so mm. it would be wonderful to be hearing more um, from those people. And I think that that really just underlines, you know, the fact that those individuals have a have a huge role to play. And and Anne, I think you, you, you mentioned earlier, and, and perhaps I perhaps I misspoke or I, I, I didn't, mm. I, I said we should be getting the information out there, but we absolutely should be combating the, the, the false information mm. as well. And we've seen we've seen fantastic examples of where that's worked incredibly well. Discovery a few years ago did a very strange fictional documentary on mermaids. I don't know why. Uh, I don't think it was. I, I, I don't think they had a cynical intent. I think they thought it was probably funny, um, but a lot of people believed it. And uh, the response to that from academia was um, uh, conservation experts and biologists. Um, publishing um, and very, very um, forcefully publishing that misinformation. And in fact, although Discovery proceeded to make a couple more of those documentaries, eventually the, um, <laughs> the, pub the public negativity about those, uh, the, about those documentaries, yeah. which was largely driven by the scientists, meant that the, the chief exec of Discovery said, we won't be making any more of these fake documentaries. <laughs> Um, so I do, yeah, I, I, I do think yeah. scientists... Um, That's a bit to your flat earth point. Thing, things do change. Mermaids are out. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Unicorns are in, I think you'll find. Uh, but uh, all right, I want to stay, I want to get a bit positive because we're, we're nearly out of time. Uh, Dr. Victoria Goodyear, who's from Birmingham University, says um, our preliminary findings from a national survey show that over 70% of participants have increased their uses of social media and over 40% believe that social media has had a positive influence on their physical activity, diet and nutrition behaviours. And mm. this is during... COVID-19. And she's in the light of this, what guidance would you give on how to deploy social media to develop support and enhance health during a global pandemic and beyond? Alice Roberts, that's got to be a question made for you. Yes, I think that the the potential there for, um, for, for helping people, for supporting people, especially when people are on their own at home and they can't make, make use of their, um, their usual networks, they um, they can't even, you know, doing things like going to the gym, keeping fit, keeping fit in a small enclosed um, space. And I think the use of social media to um, to focus on health um, has been one of those things which you know, will come out the other end, I think, um, from this and, you know, celebrated. And I think it will continue, um, you know, as a, a personal story. My my godmother was um, wondering how to keep fit at home. And I, 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 I put her in the direction of uh, Joe Wicks and, and she's been doing that every day uh, with a group of friends, and then they all get together and chat about it afterwards. So there is the imp there is the possibility there of social media having a having a, a massively positive impact. And I know Victoria Goodyear very well, and and her research is much wider than that. And it's about um, the impact of things like wearable devices. And it kind of goes right. back to something we were um, we were talking about earlier. You know, we worry about the younger generation. A lot of Victoria's research has shown that in fact. Um, children and, uh, and teenagers are very sophisticated consumers um, of, this, of this type of information, much more sophisticated than I think perhaps um, I might be as a mother or I might worry more as a mother um, thinking that they're not, they're not going to approach it critically, and they are. 
I'm going to get one more question in before we wrap up. Jonathan Ward asks, to what extent might our wish to communicate with like-minded individuals on social media risk confirmation bias about news stories? And how do we effectively remain open to perspectives which may challenge our own thinking? Anne McElvoy. You just go do it. <laughs> um, it's there. Uh, it's not too difficult to find views that aren't one's own, the sense of the question is absolutely right. We do know that social media, and certainly as a political journalist, uh, you know, and Isabel, I'm, I'm sure would have probably had similar experiences. It is sometimes, it's like being one of those balls that sort of gathers something as it goes uh, along. And you realize that you, there is a kind of a world or a room, a, the echo chamber, as we call it, which is, is very, very, very nicely where everybody's telling each other how marvelous they are. And the other thing is, if you find yourself either consuming too much or falling into, seeing as we're all uh, capable of, of doing, you know, sort of two mortal things, falling into that sort of permanently shocked tone of, I just can't believe that someone just said that. That's actually a good flag. That's the flag that you need to go somewhere else. And it doesn't mean you need to go to the wilder shores of dystopian disinformation. But if you really can't believe that people think differently from you, then it's time to make some new friends, real or virtual. Uh, well, Maury, but how much of a problem is it? Do we all exist in political bubbles? Is confirmation bias as big a problem as we think it perhaps is? Uh, confirmation bias is a habit we all have, but on the bubbles, actually, the initial research again um, turned out not to be as strongly reproducible as you might think. So the kind of academic evidence for that is weaker than the headlines it got. But let me just put it more simply. When you went to the pub a generation ago or even six months ago, did you go with a politically diverse group of people who challenged you in all kinds of ways? Or did you go with your mates who are quite similar to you and think a lot of the same things as you and read the same things as you? Come on. <laughs> so we've always lived in bubbles. Alice Roberts, how, oh, how right. damaging or how much should we worry about it? Um, I think that um, just just going back to what Anne was saying, I mean, I think that's just a it's a general example of good practice, isn't it? And that should that should be there in um, the way that we educate our children as well to talk to people who have different ideas from us and different opinions and different views. Um, that's the way we shape our own views. Um, and, and just because we get to a certain age doesn't mean our own views aren't capable of changing. We should always be testing them. They should always be tested back. It's evolution, evolutionary, I think. Um, two, I, I think two things, that, just to respond to what you were saying, two things though that strike me is, isn't one of the things, the deluge of information that we have on social media, which isn't quite like the four friends down the pub. And secondly, that actually, um, if you dare sometimes to express a contrary opinion, uh, you will, and I, I suspect Isabel can uh, testify to this, you will get brickbats thrown at you in, in no short order. Now that, yeah, that absolutely. I think, is a really fair challenge. And um, I'm conscious I'm on a panel with three women. The role of women in public life at the moment compared to men is much harder because if you stick your head above the parapet, you get a kind of abuse that I think men are not subject to. Um, mm. And that kind of polarized conversation online does inhibit what people choose to say, I think, in a damaging way. So yes, I think there can be an enforcing of conformity um, that is made much easier through the kind of publicness of social media debate. I think um, everything that Alice and Anne said about you choose what you take you take in and you can think about having a healthy information diet is the is the easier side of the equation but how do you stop people being put off being in public debate is something that does make me nervous alice did you want to come back yeah the debate you know it's, uh, social media um has to have uh etiquette it has to have um rules of engagement in the same way that any social um interaction does and i think that you know we don't get anywhere if um it starts to be um violent in terms of the language and that what we want is it is you know good robust debate where people do actually respect each other and i think that level of respect is is incredibly important and there's no you know that does fall down from time to time and i i've had to go off twitter for periods of time when it when it gets outrageous so i i know what it's like um i haven't ditched it entirely i'll go away i'll let it calm down and then i'll come back to it um but i don't think we should 
um, shy away from those more difficult conversations. And I don't think we should shy away from having conversations on social media with people with polar opposite views. Uh, yeah. You know, I've had conversations over the years as an evolutionary biologist with creationists who I actually yeah. know are not going to change their mind and they know I'm not going to change my mind. But we can have um, we can have civil debate about about what we believe. And um, and I and I actually think it's useful, not not necessarily in terms of moving on my thinking or moving on their thinking, but in in a in a social platform like Twitter, for instance, there's a lot of people listening around the edges um, who will be interested in that debate and who will get something out of it. Who may not have made their mind up yet, and you know, maybe at the end of it, they'll make their mind up in a way that I wouldn't have preferred them to. But that is the nature of. Uh, of an open society and, and free speech and, and freedom of expression. Isabel, I'm going to give you the last word on, on all of this on, well, on online bullying. Yeah. Oh, who, who should be able to, you know, should you be up for the brickbats if you're going to put your head above the parapet? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a professional feather ruffler, so, you know, I really do speak from bitter experience <laughs> on this. I'm always amazed by how many people who absolutely loathe me and don't, don't agree with any of what I say actually <laughs> follow me on Twitter. This is a kind of sport for them. But I would say sort of in defense of trolls, and I, you know, I do hate it. I get exhausted by it and dispirited by it. But sometimes it does actually act as quite a good check on my own um, thought processes. You know, sometimes I, I like to see a robust alternative point of view and it will actually slightly change my position. So this is a, a useful two way thing. I'm in no way wanting to defend the misery of a pylon, you know, it is absolutely awful being on the receiving end of that. But you do tend to know when you tweet something provocative that it's going to happen. And sometimes, just sometimes, it makes you slightly modify your opinion. And that must be, to some extent, a healthy process. It's just a pity it has to be so unpleasant. In defense of trolls, not a phrase you hear very often. Um, fascinating conversation. I think we've learned a little bit about being cynical, a little bit about perhaps there's higher levels of trust than we imagine. Thank you very much to all our guests uh, tonight. Thank you. Thank you to Isabel Oakeshott, uh, Mikel Voy, Professor Alice Roberts and Will Moy. Thank you to all of you for your questions and thank you to the University of Birmingham for hosting us all. So David, back to you. Uh, Ratula, uh, panelists, thanks very much. If we'd been doing this uh, in the Algar Concert Hall, uh, I'd have been walking on to rapturous applause uh, for a, a wide ranging, fascinating, deeply engaged debate. So thank you to you all. I suppose in reflecting on what we've just been uh, hearing, um, I'm left with probably three big uh, reflections. Uh, the first is this, that uh, sitting behind this is a sort of concern that some people have that the power of elites has diminished. And that's probably a really good thing. Um, if you go back to printing, if you go back to the Reformation, what were people objecting to? They were objecting uh, to the fact that people who had been excluded were now included. People who were powerless now had power. Um, and what we see um, with, with social media uh, is, is a massive extension of the enfranchisement of people. And I think, you know, if, if we're Democrats, we've got to believe that that is a good thing. Um, but it's also, uh, from time to time, a challenging thing. And quite a lot of the time this evening, the panel's been talking about, about truth. Um, and sometimes truth really doesn't matter. You know, I think Manchester United is the finest football team. I think Jim Clark was the greatest motor racing driver. Um, but it doesn't matter whether I'm right. Um, and, and social media is a great place to debate these things. Um, sometimes truth is just elusive it can't be established you know what is beauty um it's worth talking about it's worth debating it's worth trying to to understand but it can't be established with any degree of certainty um and so i think we've, we've just got to be relaxed about that and there's a lot that's out there on social media with which we won't agree it really doesn't matter actually it's probably rather healthy that it is out there and that we don't agree with it um but then we've come back to uh, where we think truth does matter, and, and, and why does it matter? And I think we need to remind ourselves that truth is, 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 is often difficult. Um, uh, uh, Lord Melbourne, uh, Prime Minister in the um, later 1830s, said of uh, Thomas Babington Macaulay, 
young cabinet minister at the time, um, I wish I was as certain of something as Macaulay is of everything. You know, certainty uh, doesn't come easily. Truth is often something which is challenged and contested. And uh, as Isabel was saying uh, in, in her closing remarks, that form of challenge, even when it um, comes in a disagreeable form, is not uh, without uh, its value. So within, within social media, there is that capability uh, to challenge. There is that capability to, to explore. And also, I think there is also um, the danger uh, that we assume that there is an answer out there. I thought that at the beginning, actually, of the, the COVID-19 outbreak, when we were terribly dependent um, on epidemiological models, which have now been certainly challenged and, and may well actually uh, have been mm -hmm. simply inaccurate. Uh, but there was a presumption, and one feels for the politicians at this point, that there is an answer out there. And the, one of the dangers of social media is that it, it, it does lead us to the presumption that there must be an answer rather than actually there is a, a quest to understand. So where does that leave us? I think it leaves us with two things. Uh, it leaves us, firstly, uh, remembering the importance of individuals. It's an individual choice to access social media. It's an individual choice to engage individuals here, have agency. Um, and individuals should use that agency. Anne was saying that, I think, uh, during the discussion. Um, you, sh you should explore difference. You should go elsewhere. Um, and, and, and if you're inhabiting an echo chamber, then it speaks, in a sense, to you know, a, a, a poverty of your own willingness to, to explore. And, and, and finally, going back to something that, that Will said very early on, of course, uh, these are forms of communication, these are technologies which will continue uh, to develop uh, and, and develop dramatically in, in the years to come. And I think what we have to assume ultimately uh, is that democracies find ways to moderate themselves. They find ways to accommodate new forms of debate, new forms of discussion. Um, and within that complexity and often messiness, uh, there is a way uh, in which uh, we actually moderate uh, what we do and we find truth where it matters. So I find it an absolutely fascinating uh, debate. Um, I want to thank uh, each of the panelists. Um, um, uh, I, I want to thank Isabel, uh, Will, uh, Anne and Alice. And uh, Richard, I want to thank you again for absolutely magisterial uh, sharing of another Vice Chancellor's great debate. And I hope all of you who've watched this have gained as much from it as I have. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.